So welcome everybody. So it's my pleasure to welcome you for this third edition of the Alter Property Data Conference. Uh, so today the program is going to be quite rich. Uh, there will be two parts. The first part will be about the, let's say, the, the analysis of emerging and developing economies uh, with alternative tools. And the second part will be more with methodological aspects uh, that could include emerging and developing economies, but not only. Uh, to start with, uh, we have also the pleasure to welcome Professor Amadorai. So thanks a lot for uh, making the, the keynote. So to, to make a very uh, short presentation of you, uh, you have a very rich profile. You are a professor of financial economics in the Imperial College London. You have a lot of research interest, financial economics, household finance, behavioral economics, international finance, and of course, real estate. So um, now I, with this very short introduction, uh, I give you the floor for the keynote and thanks again for uh, for agreeing to, to make this keynote. The floor is yours, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> and thanks for the invitation to do this. Um, I will share some slides um, as well, <clears throat> but to begin with what I wanted to do was to um, just sort of say that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be invited to do this also because I think that this topic is extremely important, um, especially because there's a little bit of a data shortage in emerging and developing economies. I mean, this is something I've spent some time uh, thinking about. Uh, I have some survey articles in the annual review of economics and the annual review of financial economics on um, the household finance landscape in emerging economies, as well as on um, international comparative household finance. and. The, some of the points that we make in these survey articles are that it's really important to um, do research that improves the well-being of the several billions that are in emerging and developing economies. We have a tendency to spend our time uh, on topics that are primarily focused on developed and advanced economies, mainly because the data tends to be available there. So it's almost as though uh, we are spending more time looking at places where the data is rather than where necessarily the questions are the most important and will affect the well-being of the maximum number of people. So this um, idea of having a conference and to have all of this very rich work that all of you are doing on tracking um, uh, movements in, especially the real estate market in emerging and developing countries is extremely important. Um, I, I think that real estate is particularly important also because of some of the work in my survey article um, on um, the household finance landscape in emerging economies with Christian Badarinza and Vimal Balasubramaniam because it tends to be about 80% on average of the asset side of the household balance sheet, especially in emerging and developing economies. Uh, it's also very high in advanced economies, but not quite as high. Um, so for residential real estate, this is very important. And as we're recently seeing in China, uh, also economies uh, as a whole depend on both residential and commercial real estate. So this can actually have macroeconomic aggregate consequences as well. So the more information that we can bring to bear using alternative data sources, the better it is. Um, now, what I wanted to do uh, in the remaining time that I have available um, is to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, some of my own work, um, which is on the subject, uh, which uses data from a couple of uh, property tech companies in India <clears throat> to think about a very important topic, which is uh, tax um, uh, value. I mean, valuations of property for tax assessment purposes. So let me share my screen so I can show you some slides uh, on this topic. Uh, and this hopefully will give an illustration of some of the things that I think of as being particularly important. Um, so let's see. OK, so all right. OK, great. So uh, can someone give me a little bit of feedback? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, excellent. Great. So this is joint work with Santosh Anagol at the Wharton School. Um, Antoine Utwiller, who was formerly at Imperial College, but is now just this year moved to Queen Mary uh, and uh, Vimal Balasubramaniam, uh, my frequent co-author and also a co-author on my survey article, who's at Queen Mary. And so let me sort of set the stage. Um, very briefly, and then I will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the patterns in the data and the sources of the data. Um, and then um, I'm happy to take a few questions if there are any uh, for a few minutes at the end. So I'll keep this very short, probably about 20 minutes, uh, and then we can sort of move to a Q&A if there's any uh, interest. 
So the motivation uh, for this particular project is that in low income countries, uh, there is uh, substantially less tax revenue collected as a proportion of GDP. Uh, so as a fraction of GDP, the proportion um, collected in terms of tax revenue uh, is about two thirds the amount that is collected in high income countries. And one topic that has frequently come up or one explanation that has frequently come up for this is that this may be because of the fact that people are under reporting economic activity uh, in emerging economies. Uh, and in particular, um, our study is very interested in the topic of property value under reporting, which is, um, you know, for this audience, I think uh, an important one. So what we're trying to do here is to sort of bring three fields together, real estate, public economics um, and development economics uh, to try to do this. And, and at the heart of these things is the alternative data that we're going to be able to use to shed light on these questions. So just to motivate the importance of the question, property taxes account for about 5% or so of government tax revenues in OECD countries, and this includes both stamp taxes and ongoing property taxes. Uh, properties tend to be extremely hard to value. There's a lot of heterogeneity in these valuations, which actually gives people a lot of room uh, to report valuations that may actually be different from the objective or market valuation of those properties. Uh, property taxes have also come up um, as a solution to tackle wealth and income inequality, so they're much in current debates. So there's some papers by uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Tomar Piketty uh, that talk about this. And in many emerging economies, property investments are considered a major store of illicit wealth. And in India, this is generally known as black money. Um, so this is another reason why bringing some of these alternative data sets to bear can be very helpful in bringing transparency as well uh, to these underlying uh, economic questions. So in India, the institutional context is that even the Indian Department of Revenue, which is the main tax collection authority, uh, reports substantial underreporting in the context of transactions taxes. And the mechanism that they've been talking about is that maybe the buyer and the seller get together, they misreport the two transaction value with an agreed fraction uh, that is paid under the table in cash between buyer and seller. Now, there's a policy solution that has been applied in the Indian context, which turns out also to have been applied in 35 of the top 82 population cities in the world, uh, including cities in, uh, apart from India, Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico, Philippines, and Thailand, um, and in fact, also in use in some advanced economies as well. So how do people do this? So what they do is, the policy solution is, that the government says, if your property is located in a particular area, then we set a guidance value. And that guidance value is a per square foot valuation for the property, which places a floor on the tax base. And if you report anything below that guidance value, uh, with some very rare exceptions, the government will force you to pay taxes based on the official guidance value that they set. Obviously, if you report a value above that guidance value, you pay tax on the reported value of the property. In all of these cases, your statutory responsibility is to pay taxes on a third object, which is neither the guidance value nor the reported value, but the true market value, which is what the government is trying to get at. Now, this kind of policy is very common in real estate, but it's also very common in other contexts. Um, you can think about mark to market uh, accounting, for example, for financial assets. Uh, and so you might imagine that there are formulaic values that government set or regulators set um, on the basis of which uh, tax payments or risk assessments are done. And uh, to date, there is no empirical evidence on the effectiveness of this type of policy, which is where the alternative data comes into play. So what we do in this paper is to develop a new method to estimate property value under reporting. Uh, and in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, there's a whole set of people um, in Mumbai, which is a very large city. Um, uh, and, and this is our application that I'll talk about in a second. And we're going to compare the distribution of those reported property values that people have self-reported uh, around the government guidance value that is set in each location, uh, which is the tax base that the government assesses on the basis of. And using an alternative data source, and by the way, even these reported property values are coming from an alternative data source, a property technology company, uh, which I'll spend a little time talking about. We compare this with a third party measure of true underlying transactions prices that try to track market valuation. 
And by comparing the distributions of reported values um, with these true underlying transactions prices uh, in a distribution uh, and centering both of those around the guidance values, uh, we're able to come up with a new measure of property value under reporting, which we think of as being an important contribution and something that governments can also use if they are uh, if they are interested uh, to adopt our approach. Um, now we apply the method on the universe of all property transactions conducted between 2013 and 2022 in Mumbai. Uh, this comprises roughly a third of Maharashtra state's total stamp tax revenues, and Maharashtra is a very large, important state in India, contributing roughly um, a fifth of India's GDP. Um, on this tax base, uh, whether it's the reported tax base or the guidance value, uh, Transactions taxes are about 5% on stamp duty on any given transaction. There's a registration fee of 1% of property value, and then there's some small annual property taxes, but it also serves as the tax base for present and future capital tax gains as well. So this is the policy solution that I was talking about earlier, and I was talking about the fact that um, we have uh, these different taxes in Mumbai. Now, uh, so let me sort of show you a picture which I think will make things a little bit clearer. And this is the slide that's called Quick Preview. So hopefully you can see this. Um, so can everyone see this picture? Huh? Yes. Excellent. Great. So what this picture is doing is it's centering everything around the government guidance value. So for every property or every area, I'm essentially just centering things at zero. The zero is the government guidance value. This is 50% above the government's guidance value, which is 0 0.5 on the x-axis, 100% above the value, 50% below, 100% below, and so on and so forth. So there are some cases in which they're reporting very tiny values for these properties. The blue distribution is the distribution of reported property values. And as you can see, there is an enormous spike, which is also called bunching in the public economics literature, precisely at the government guidance value. Put differently, a lot of people are reporting that their properties are worth exactly equal to the government guidance value. And then you can see that there are uh, quite a few people who report that their property is worth more than the government, government guidance value. And so the blue distribution kind of tails off to the right. And then there's actually many fewer people reporting less than the government guidance value because usually the government will simply tax you as if you had reported the government guidance value. The only reason to report lower if you're prepared to go and challenge the government in court, which is, has a very low probability uh, of winning. But some people do that, and so you can see these uh, properties to the left as well. The green distribution is from a third party source that tries to track the distribution of actual market values for these properties. And you can see that that distribution looks very different from the reported value distribution, which is bunching exactly at the government guidance value. So what is extremely interesting about this is that we have a third party measure that says that property prices are smoothly distributed around the government guidance value. In fact, if anything, the government guidance value seems to be an underestimate of the mean of the distribution of reported prop of actual third third party certified market values, um, which is coming from a, a source that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but when people self report the values of their properties, they're reporting disproportionate numbers of people are saying their properties are worth exactly what the government says is the formulaic tax based assessment. So why is this useful? It's useful because it tells you that people are on average generally reporting their property value to be substantially lower than the value that it actually should be, which is uh, given to you by the market value distribution. And in fact, the difference between these two distributions is essentially giving you a measure of the lost tax revenue from the fact that people are essentially under reporting their property valuations. So what's nice about these alternative property data sources is that it allows you to build a picture like this and sort of give us a little bit, give, you know, extract a little bit of an insight into how reporting behavior is contrasted with, uh, uh, you know, a, an objective third party measure of the distribution of underlying <clears throat> market values. Now, 
the paper itself, uh, which I hope you will all engage with uh, given time, um, goes into a number of different robustness checks, uh, a lot of work on methodology and so on and so forth. We talk about this measure that we come up with and so on and so forth. But for the purposes of this keynote, all I want to do is to give you a sense that this is actually something that you can kind of build uh, with the data that we have access to. And this very striking picture then gives us an ability to interrogate further, which we do uh, in the paper at some length. In fact, I'm not going to be able to show you the model and so on and so forth. Um, but it turns out that this is connected to a very big related literature on tax evasion, on property valuations and so on. Uh, we build a model, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. But for the purposes of this keynote, what I want to do is to first spend a little time telling you about the underlying data sources that allowed us to construct this, given the focus uh, of today's conference, uh, and then maybe to spend one or two more minutes on some other results and then take, take a few questions. OK, so. Um, OK, so now just having shown you that picture, uh, what I do want to tell you for a second is that for every given household, uh, we have a reported value, we have the government guidance value, and then we have the associated third party measure of market value. And so this reveals their under reporting perfectly uh, in uh, it, as we can see R, which is the registered property value is generally observable. You can scrape that off of websites or indeed here we get it from a property technology firm. The government reported guidance values or the government set guidance values are also observable and readily available. A third party measure of market value is more difficult to observe and that measure uh, which is independently assessed of both the government guidance value and the reported value is needed and that is where the data gap lies and that's one of the things that uh, we, we view as a contribution of this paper. Uh, we we can then get into the confirms later uh, if people have, have some questions. OK, so here's the data that we use uh, in order to construct those plots. Um, uh, so uh, the, the data on both reported property values um, and guidance values are coming from sale deeds that are registered in India, in Mumbai in particular with the Inspector General of Registration and Controller of Stamps. Uh, these have the reported value uh, of the property, self-reported by the uh, seller of the property, um, and sorry, the buyer of the property, as well as the guidance value. Uh, we have the location of where that property is in terms of its latitude and longitude. We have the registration date of the transaction, the amount of transactions tax paid. Uh, we cross check these reported values using reported aggregate tax revenue raised from property re registration in Maharashtra state. Uh, and we have coverage from 2013 to 2022, uh, which is roughly that plot that I showed you earlier reflects close to 350,000 transactions worth about $106 million. Sorry, was there a, a question or did someone? OK. All right. Um, so uh, the uh, the source, which is our measure of the market value, is all new real estate. This is coming from a company called Prop Equity Analytics. The other one's coming from Prop Stack Analytics. This is all new real estate projects with potential revenues over $10 million. So they actually go and do mystery shopping. They go and track the values of these uh, properties by asking the developers in particular how much they would sell a property for. And so that is the green distribution that I showed you earlier. Again, we're able to cross um, uh, sort of match these two data sets uh, using latitude and longitude um, uh, and date. Uh, these, uh, the prop equity analytics also has the amenities, the number and the format of apartment units. Uh, and this has about 670,000 launch units. When we merge these two, we have a data set that's about uh, roughly 150 to 200,000 properties over the over the period. OK, um, so uh, when we do the match, we match basically for every single property. So to give you an example of a match, here's a registered transaction in the prop stack data, and we're able to match it exactly in the case of Kanakia Paris. That is the marketing photo for Kanakia Paris uh, that is in the brochure. Uh, this is what it actually looks like in reality, which uh, may be a little disappointing to some uh, who decided to buy the property if you were offered this. I thought it was appropriate given that it's a Bachelier Society conference to show you Kanakia Paris in Mumbai as well. I hope some of you will appreciate that. Um, in any case, we're sort of, this is the final sample. This is Mumbai city, and this is where the transactions are located, and we're back. 
uh, to this particular graph. The rest of the paper does more, uh, but I think just in the interest of time and maybe to see if people have any questions, I'll stop here uh, with my with my talk. Um, and uh, I look forward uh, to seeing any questions that anybody might have. Okay. Okay. Thanks yeah. a lot, Professor Madai. So, are there any questions from the, the audience? If not, perhaps I would have one. To what extent would these results be transposable? Could you transpose these results to other countries? I mean, uh, not only India, but uh, other countries that may face the same kind of problem. Yeah, this is a good question. In fact, um, once we did our study, um, we were. Uh, it was brought to our attention by some uh, some authors that they were they had data that allowed them to plot something similar for Brazil. Uh, and in fact, uh, they did plot it, and it looks very similar to the plot that you see in India. Uh, so the one that we see in Mumbai is actually not very different from the one that they see uh, in, I think it's Sao Paulo. Uh, we refer to that in our paper. It's actually, we we actually have the picture as an appendix figure uh, that shows you that it also applies to Brazil. But um, the system is used in 35 of the top 82 population cities around the world. So we believe mm -hmm. that the methodology that we're pioneering here is hopefully applicable to a very broad range of emerging and developing uh, economies in addition uh, to India. OK, OK. But in the audience, there, there are some people from the World Bank, so I guess that this kind of information uh, could be interesting. And I confirm that, incidentally, having the Eiffel Tower in Paris in front of your flat increases the value of your flight, but perhaps 5, 10 or 20 percent. It's <laughs> not the case in Mumbai, but in Paris it's the case. <laughs> right. I suspect that the effect, valuation effect is perhaps somewhat lower. Uh, yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> Um, thanks for the answer. Any other Great. questions? Ah, Peter, yes, please uh, go ahead. Hi, very interesting uh, paper. Um, I have a question. So you, you talk about the sales deed. So that means that part of the of the money paid for, for the house is not included in the sales deed, which means that it's it's not official money. It's it's um, black money. Is that what it what it means? Yeah, I mean, I think a different way to say this is that if you look at the valuation that people are reporting on the sales deed, it tends to be, um, you know, generally speaking, lower. Uh, it's sort of centered at the value that the government sets for the area, but it's not as high as what we would estimate using a third party measure of market value. As you say, that actually does reduce the property value on the sales deed. Now, it's interesting that you should say that because actually uh, one of the extensions that we look at in the paper is that when you report a lower value on the sales deed, the mortgage that you can get on the property is also lower because most banks will lend to you only on the basis of the registered sales deed value of the property. So we find actually that for properties that take larger mortgages, this underreporting is actually substantially lower. And for properties that take very high, like don't they pay cash only, um, and don't have mortgages associated with them, that the underreporting rate is substantially higher. So this goes along with this cash versus credit uh, issue as well. So credit seems to kind of have a disciplining force on black money. Uh, so so banks it. use the the sales deed as the, the value of the house. Exactly, that's okay. right. So that places a constraint on your ability to lie if you're interested in having credit, if you see what I mean. OK, this could be even interesting for countries like France, in which you have a, a taxation on the capital, but only the housing capital. Now the, the financial capital is excluded from taxation. But now, of course, uh, if you under declare the value of your housing, the taxation will be lower and you don't have this uh, this force from the mortgage playing. So, yes, that could be even interesting to, to see if we could apply it to other countries like France. OK, that's exactly right. OK, other questions? If there are none, but of course, um, the floor is open to continue the conversation uh, bilaterally. It's also the, let's say, the advantage of the Alter Property Data Network to start to initiate some uh, ideas and presentation and then to continue interactions uh, later on. So, of course, it's this network has been designed for that. So, if there are um, currently, if there are not any other questions, 
And I will just thank you uh, a lot warmly, uh, Professor Madalai, for your introduction, uh, which indeed gives some insights and I interesting ideas for uh, uh, on this point of view. And um, well, of course, we keep in touch if you can be interested by other aspect of the network. So now we are going, there is a nice transition because now we are going to see uh, another perspective from the World Bank that has been web scraping uh, several uh, big cities and several uh, emerging economies. Following what was done uh, in the European Commission um, when I was there uh, with some colleagues uh, about, uh, let's say, rather OECD countries.